Uh, so just so you're aware of it, and you'll get a notice on your screen perhaps that this is being recorded and we will share the link to it in a follow-up email in case you would like to watch the program again or you want to show it to someone else. Uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel. So as we begin this program, we would like to offer a land acknowledgement. This land that now constitutes the town of Maynard is part of the ancestral and traditional home of the Nipmuc peoples who were here for thousands of years before the town was established. Let us take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of the land who are not forgotten and whose descendants are still with us here in Massachusetts. Next, some housekeeping items for the evening. Laura has kindly agreed to take questions throughout the presentation. So you can feel free to enter uh, questions and comments in the chat box as we're going along. Or if you prefer to speak on camera, please use the raise hand feature, which you can find under reactions in your Zoom window. And we'll see that your hand is raised and you have a question and we'll ask you to unmute yourself and speak. And we'll also open things up to questions after the presentation. By the way, I should say who the heck I am. I'm Jean McGuire, the director of Maynard Public Library. Nice to see all of you. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Laura Howick has had a 34 year career in four art museums, and her work has included implementing almost all facets of art museum education public programs, studio art classes, teacher workshops, docent training, a community gallery, and gallery interpretation. One of Laura's specialties is creating educational interactive exhibitions for families. In addition, she is one of four authors of Art Works for Schools, a curriculum for teaching thinking in and through the arts. And she was a contributor and editor for Inspiring Minds, an introduction to object-based learning, a CD created by Fitchburg Art Museum. She taught museum education and interpretation in the Tufts University Museum Studies graduate program, and over the years has given workshops for numerous schools and other museums. She has a master's degree in art education from Philadelphia Colleges of the Arts and a bachelor's degree from Connecticut College. Laura is also a resident of Maynard and very kindly donated her time to put together and present this program this evening. She is going to give us a virtual tour of the Fitchburg Art Museum. So take it away, Laura, you can go ahead and share your screen. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna just say a few words first. Um, well, first of all, hello everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, I've been asked to give a presentation about the Fitchburg Art Museum, a little bit about its history and what it's like today. So what I'm gonna be showing you is technically a video, but it is actually a combination of some moving images and a lot of still images. And I'll be just narrating over it. So if anytime you wanna ask a question, um, it's easy for me to pause everything and uh, take questions. By the way, um, I am a firm believer that there is no such thing as a stupid question. So um, please feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, now I will share my screen. So the Fitchburg Art Museum exists today because it was the dream of this woman, Eleanor Norcross. She was an artist from Fitchburg, born in 1854. Her father was a lawyer who later became the first mayor of Fitchburg. And after that, he became a congressman. Her mother was a teacher who sadly died when Eleanor was 13. So when her father went to Washington, D.C., uh, she went with him, but after about a year, she left to study art at the Art Students League in New York City, which included studying um, a little bit, at least, with 
the American Impressionist painter, William Merritt Chase. In 1883, she went to the Netherlands to study with Alfred Stevens and later to Paris where she lived and painted for 40 years, although she frequently returned to Fitchburg in the summers. When she was in France and during her travels in Europe, which she did a lot of, she collected all kinds of things like ceramics, Japanese prints, drawings, wood carvings, textiles, bronze plaques, and more all with the idea of bringing it back to Fitchburg and sharing it so that people could learn about art. Eventually, this idea grew into her dream of starting an art museum or an art center in Fitchburg. So when she died, she left a bequest of her money and her paintings and her, the things she'd collected to the city of Fitchburg if they would make and maintain an art center. And they did wanna do that. So it, they founded the Fitchburg Art Association in 1925. And after buying an old barn and hiring a Boston law, uh, I'm sorry, a Boston firm of women architects, which was I think like the only Boston firm of women architects at the time, to renovate it, um, they opened it to the public in 1929. And here's more of Paris. This is what the salons were like when big art exhibitions. So this is the renovated barn. As you can see, um, it's the front of it. And it was dedicated in 1925. And this is the back of that barn many years later um, when the gray building on the left, I'm sorry, on the right has been added to it. And then that building now connects to this sort of overhead bridge And there's our sculpture named Thurston. And the overhead bridge connects to a new building called the Simons Building. And that was put on in 1989, and as was the bridge. And there's the entrance. So today our mission is as it says, to be a catalyst for learning, creativity, and community building. Our focus is very strongly on doing programs and other things that benefit the community. So in addition to doing exhibitions, um, a lot of our programs are working with community organizations and, and the schools. And I'll give you some more details about that much later. So we're going to go inside. This is our lobby. We're sort of looking to the right. And most first time visitors are really surprised at how big we are. And you'll notice a doorway, the gray doorway, and then this hallway to the right. And then we're work, looking to the left. We have a pretty big lobby. <laughs> um, usually we have those two square tables uh, out for people to sit at. Um, these white tables have been set up for a special program we were having that day when I was filming. So we'll start with this gallery. It's right behind our front desk. 
And this is where the Abelardo Morel exhibition is right now. And I'm not gonna show you every image, but I wanted to give you a sense of the size of the gallery. And this gallery changes regularly, um, but not on a, a real fixed schedule. We often show photography in here. Um, the museum has a very large collection of photography in its permanent collection. Um, unfortunately, these are not in our permanent collection, um, but they, they would be a great addition if we could. So that's looking one way, this is the other side. And if you're not familiar with his Morel's work, he does what's a layering technique where he literally takes a room and turns it into a pinhole camera. And that's why you get the upside down image um, in the room. We have a community gallery and that's right next to the gallery we were just looking at. This is for groups. Could be a school group, artist group, or family, uh, sorry, uh, community group. Right now we have pastel showing. And this is our Discover Ancient Egypt gallery, the beginning of it. This was really designed for families and for school groups. It was the most popular gallery requested by school groups. Um, so this area is sort of where we introduce children to the idea of ancient Egypt. So we have a map of where Egypt is. And that's the door into the gallery. And a lot of what is in the exhibition are paintings. And they're paintings by this man. This is Joseph Lyndon Smith. And he was actually at the excavations when they happened in the 1920s and 30s. And what he did was he would go into the tombs and paint what he saw on the tomb walls. So on the right, you see those two figures. That's the tomb wall. And on the left, next to Joseph Lennon Smith, is his painting. Um, he really copied them very faithfully. Um, down to every little ding in the stone and, and flaking of the paint. And he did that for 40 years. So this is uh, the hallway when you enter. On the left is a mural of the Book of the Dead. And on the right, some gods and goddesses. We do have a mummy. Kids love this. You then can go down another ramp. And at the bottom of the ramp, uh, there's a lot more to be seen. This is looking to the left. This is the diorama of mummification, and it is the favorite of all children who visit. It shows the process on each side, and this is a close-up of one of those. We also have interactive components in this. That was a um, step pyramid puzzle. This is where they can spell their name in hieroglyphs and make a rubbing of it. We have a reproduction of the Rosetta Stone, which is how we are now able to understand hieroglyphs. And again, from the bottom of the stairs, looking to the right, we, uh, we've, we see our section on the Nile River. We've divided the gallery into sections that are designated by these large labels um, that you see in the lower left corner.
So there's the panel that designates the Nile section with Joseph Linden Smith's paintings on the background. And this map is really, again, aimed at school groups. We put all kinds of ge geographical information on it, but we also have um, where the ancient Egyptians got their natural materials so that we can talk about trade and travel, uh, shipping. And we also give them some vocabulary. Um, on the far side, there are some pictures of animals that can be found in one of the paintings. So if a mother has a very bored three-year-old, they can look for animals. And um, the Nile River challenge game is, um, sort of like a trivial pursuit game um, that helps people explore this map. And if you keep looking to the right from there, we look into the everyday life section of the exhibition. And you'll notice the sort of rust colored square in the middle there at a table. And I'll explain what that is in just a minute. So this is the ancient Egyptian employment office. Uh, and it's another interactive space. And this is where um, People can apply for one of four jobs that were possible in ancient Egypt. And uh, the jobs range from being a farmer, which was at the very low end of the social structure, to being a vizier, which was like the governor, sort of the second in command to the pharaoh. And This is an example of one of the scripts that we have for each of those jobs. So you can see that the interviewer person gets to ask all the questions in red and the multiple choice answers. The, the person who's interviewing for the job gives an answer and then they turn the page and the correct answers at the top of the next page. And they can keep score if they want to and find out if they you know, would have gotten the job. And this is not an artifact. We don't try to pass it off as anything real. It is um, a, a, a reproduction of King Tut's throne and it's there literally to sit in and have your picture taken. Um, I've had entire college classes sit on that, sit in it and around it. And I've had lots of giggling children there too. So this is the rest of that space. We talk about personal adornment. They were really big into that. So the case has some jewelry in it. That's another Joseph Linden Smith painting of the male and female, and then an actual necklace next to it. And here you can see how the necklace was used. Okay, so we've made a big jump going from ancient Egypt. Uh, we've now gone upstairs from the lobby and we are up in the two large galleries in the new building. And these galleries are where we show contemporary art. And we change these exhibitions three times a year. Um, in the summer, we always show what we call the regional exhibition of art and craft. 
And that's um, a juried exhibition and people from within a 30 mile radius of the museum can apply. But we've been doing that for 85 years <laughs> um, and we will keep doing that. So this is one of the exhibitions that we have up right now in one of the large galleries here in the new building. It's called Joyride. And these are all from Terry and Eva Herndon's collection. And it's, they're not just about cars. It's about cars and car culture and how cars have affected the landscape and American culture. These are a couple examples. He has lots of different styles, uh, lots of different subjects. This is if when you walk into that gallery, this is look to the right. Again, you can see it's a pretty large gallery. Um, we've actually had as part of an exhibition, a full size, uh, steamroller <laughs> in here that actually played uh, the national anthem, but that's, that's another day. So this is still Joyride. And this is called Angel on the Four Level Interchange. More examples like Jacob Lawrence. And then for all of our contemporary art exhibitions, uh, we have what's called a learning lounge. And um, it literally sits between the two large galleries where we show contemporary art. And it's meant to help people understand sort of the bigger context for what they're looking at. So it's, it's educational, it's interactive, um, it's meant for, again, adults and children. So this is a wall where we're talking about how cars have manifested themselves in American culture. So we have lots of examples. You know, car can be an expression of gender or an expression of wealth artistic expression. And we have things to do. This is an activity where we ask people, if you could go anywhere, where would you go? And they write their destinations on the little cars and then attach them to the map. And we usually have some sort of drawing activity. Um, in this case, it seemed only natural that we'd have people design a car. Um, we provided lots of examples of some very unusual looking cars to, to hopefully inspire people. Uh, I've left a few of the drawings up. Um, we do collect them and we get, we get some really marvelous um, imaginative drawings that people leave for us. Again, the Learning Lounge changes with every exhibition that we do. And this is the second exhibition that is up in these galleries. Usually both of these galleries um, are hosting a single exhibition. Um, in this case, we decided to host another collection by another collector and Arthur Goldberg's focus is on uncovering the human condition. So it's a lot of the human figure, both sculpture and paintings and collages. So you can see he's collected a lot of different styles.
So I also um, did a learning lounge for this one. It's actually in the same space. It's just on the opposite wall of the one for cars. Um, again, I often include um, a historical context. So here we're talking about how the human figure has been shown in art throughout history. And this is another interactive where I recreated images from the exhibition and have people rate them on scales. So, you know, between happy and sad, how would you rate it? Friendly or unfriendly? Very subjective, but it's also meant to hopefully get people thinking about, uh, and particularly children, how facial expressions read. All right, we're leaving the, those galleries and we're about to cross through the, um, the bridge that connects the two buildings. I think you can see through the window, you can see Thurston. And this is what it's like to go through that connector. And there are more photos from Arthur Goldberg's there. And when you get to the bottom, you see moving objects. This is from our African art collection. We have a pretty large uh, collection of African art. We have a very active <laughs> curator of, of African, Oceanic and Native American art. And uh, the piece that's straight ahead is actually a, a mask that is worn at night, spirit mask. Laura, we do have one question. Okay. I can take it. Yeah. Um, Julie asks, are all exhibitions at the museum in Spanish and English? I love seeing both in these photos. Yes, all of our labels are in Spanish and English. Um, we're one of the only or few, at least, um, bilingual art museums. I know children's museums have been doing it for a while, but um, we think we're like one of the first art museums to do it. That's fantastic. So this exhibition includes um, oceanic art and African art, and they are mostly ceremonial objects. And I wanna point out, you'll see one doorway there and And there's the second doorway that leads across a hallway to two more galleries for this exhibition. But in between, we have Oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is from the, the first gallery. So in between, we have the learning lounge um, aimed at for the moving objects exhibition. Um, I'm only showing you part of it, but um, there are clothing you can try on. We have some um, metal masks with magnetic pieces so kids can kind of create their own mask. And then they can even turn it around and look through it into a mirror so they can see themselves. Um, so, so if you have grandchildren or children, um, that's a big hit. And there's some uh, there's a close-up of some of the fabrics. We have some educational components as well. Again, thinking about school groups. So this is in the next gallery.
And this is a, a masquerade. It's called a messenger mask. And this figure or these messengers were meant to serve as contacts between um, the world and ancestral spirits. This is actually um, made recently. It was commissioned by our curator. This is kente cloth, which is from Ghana. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but it's woven in vertical strips. And then those strips are sewn together to make you know, wide pieces of fabric. And even today, um, kente cloth is given um, for special occasions. Um, like when somebody graduates from college, often they'll get a piece of kente cloth if they're Ghanaian. And a lot of the patterns, even though to us they, they look very geometric, they actually have meanings for the culture. And this is the third gallery for this exhibition. It's some Ethiopian crosses. This is a scroll for healing and some headwear that denotes rank. We do try to give, again, context when we can. This is a woman's vest. It indicates she's ready for marriage. And we also have contemporary um, art from Africa. Uh, this is a contemporary photograph. And we, and this is a contemporary version of a, a, a cloth. So we're now gonna go upstairs in this building. We're in the old building and we're going to learn more about Eleanor Norcross. And you can see now looking back at the new building and the uh, sort of connecting bridge that we came through. So here's Eleanor again, and next to her is Frances Vos Emerson and Sophia Lord Pittman. These were two of her lifelong friends and uh, who also studied art and they were the executors of her will. So they were the ones who had to make the final decision to um, offer her estate to the city with the idea of making a museum or an art center. Um, but Eleanor went to Wheaton Seminary, which later became Wheaton College. And the writings they have from her, um, she was definitely um, not a shy person. <laughs> and she was definitely a feminist ahead of her time. So you see the quote here, um, whenever opportunities are equal, we are not found wanting. And uh, she has similar things she said in other writings. Sorry, I don't know why it's not moving. Oh, there we go. So we have historical information about her. Um, we also, on that wall, you can see those are some wooden things she's collected, the deck, the deck arts that she loved to collect. She collected furniture, ceramics, and fabric, um, fabric samples a lot. 
again, they weren't always the best examples because she didn't have a lot of money. <clears throat> but again, she was thinking about Fitchburg and bringing them back. Um, in terms of her paintings, she, she had several subject areas that she did. Um, so flowers were certainly one of them. And interior scenes. Portraits. I love the attitude this woman has. And this is our most recently acquired portrait. We actually got it from someone in Paris. This is a, an image of her father who would come and visit her in Paris. The painting is called My Studio. And if you look carefully in the background, you can see um, all kinds of small decorative items, again, that she collected and she, that she liked to surround herself with. She loved beautiful things and wanted to live with them. She also loved the Decorative Arts Museum. And in, in terms of um, painting interiors, she not only did small rooms like you saw earlier, but she went and painted the galleries in the Decorative Arts Museum and even things that were in the cases, which we'll see in a moment. So that's, that's the end of talking about the art in the museum. But I did want to tell you a bit about us and the community work we do. Here's another picture of the community gallery uh, with people in it. This was an exhibition of student artwork. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we are bilingual, uh, including we even have bilingual labels for the Egyptian gallery. We've done several public artworks for the city. We host the Fitchburg Farmers Market in the winter. And we're, we're open for free on first Thursdays of every month. And uh, we've done a number of programs. We work with the Head Starts Preschool in the city. Um, we have a program where we sponsor an art therapist to work with people who are in recovery from addiction. And uh, we just started an after school program um, for the local middle school. And those are just some of the, the larger things that we do. Uh, and this was another recent community program we did. This is called Three, I'm sorry, Fitchburg Families First. Um, we started this last December when we found out that students in Fitchburg Public Schools had a dire need for food. So uh, we partnered with several community organizations and uh, began distributing food uh, in these nice red bags. Eventually we started doing less food and more gift cards to market basket, um, which made the whole process a lot easier. But it was a sort of a drive up. Um, people would line up in their cars and they'd drive up and we'd hand them a bag of food through the window. We also included a, a very simple art project uh, for the children. And we did this for six dates, and then we added three more that went into the spring. This is um, a project that we're very excited about. Um, it has not yet happened, but it is in the process. 
Um, the top image is a former middle school that is right across the street from the museum. And there are two other buildings behind that. And uh, New View Communities, which is a community development organization, has purchased them from the city and they are going to develop them into artists work and live spaces. And there, there will be, I think, 54 of these spaces between the three buildings. Uh, below is what uh, an architect has envisioned it might look like in the future. Um, we're probably about three to five years from seeing that actually materialize, but they are in the process of getting their funding together. So once we have that right across the street, I, I think it's going to be a real game changer for the museum and for the community also. This is part of the museum's commitment to working on community development as well. And that's it. I'm happy to take any questions. What a wonderful tour. Thank you, Laura. Yes, anyone who has any questions or comments, you can enter them into the chat area or you can use the raise hand feature in your Zoom window. It's found under reactions and we'll be able to see that you'd like to ask a question. We can call on you and uh, unmute you and you can ask your question. I have a few questions before uh, get, get, can give people some time to enter theirs. Uh, one question I have is actually just related to that Egyptian exhibition. The jewelry in that exhibition, are, are those original artifacts? Yes. They are. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's exciting. Um, so if, can you tell us about any upcoming exhibitions? that you think might be of interest? Um, yes, in February, we will be changing over those two large galleries that are upstairs in the new building. And we'll be showing a lot of photography, particularly um, the photography of Frank, I'm gonna bump, Richard Richardson and his students. Um, he taught at Clark for about 40 years. And so he has a lot of students and a lot of them have become quite well known in their own right. So that will be upstairs in the new building. Sounds great. Uh, we have a question from Steve, first of all, who says, thank you very much. Uh, it must be years since I was at the Fitchburg Art Museum because I don't remember the new building at all. Uh, I missed the very beginning of the program. When did it open? 1989. It is a, a beautiful addition. It goes really nicely. One question also uh, that I had, Laura, was when you were talking about that middle school across the street and the artist spaces. Um, is that owned by the museum now or is that someone else, you know, another organization running that? It's not owned by the museum. Um, it's owned by New View Communities, which is the development organization uh, that's going to um, develop it. So we sort of advise on you know, what kinds of spaces artists might need, um, but we don't have any uh, financial responsibility for it. Nice connection there. It's Great to hear that that's happening. Yeah. So close to the museum. We also had a comment, uh, Gail, who says hi from Framingham, big fan of the Fitchburg Art Museum. Oh, thank you. Nice <laughs> to have someone here from Framingham. And uh, another question I have for you is about, you know, what the cost of admission is. And I believe you said, uh, is it first Fridays that are free? 
first the first Thursday of every oh, first month. Thursday. Sorry, we're open, we're open for free, and um, often in the winter we have the farmers market that same day or evening. They they come around three o'clock. Um, we have a uh, generally for adults it's a nine dollar admission fee. Seniors it's five dollars. Children twelve and under are free. Um, if you're a resident of Fitch in the Ward 4B, which is the neighborhood around the museum. They have free admission. Fitchburg Public School students and staff all have free admission. Students at Fitchburg State University and Mount Wachusett Community College have free admission. Um, and we have a number of discounts. So if you um, have a AAA membership, you can get a discount. And if you're a veteran, you can get a discount. And there, there are others. So don't be shy. <laughs> and, and truth be told, um, we've never turned anybody away if they couldn't afford to pay. Well, and the admission sounds like a, a good bargain, really, for all you get. That's terrific. Uh, we have another comment from Julie who says, thank you. I live in Maynard and work at Monty Tech and can't wait to visit FAM. I've never been. What an amazing local resource. Oh, thank you. And um, because I live in Maynard, I can tell you that it's only 45 minutes to get there um, and probably a little less on a weekend when the traffic's not so bad. Um, so, and we have free parking and it, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to get to. All right, well, one last question from me, Laura, and uh, we'll see if anyone else has anything before we wrap up. But I was wondering about how the museum fared through COVID and uh, you know, what has the museum been doing maybe to attract visitors back, you know, anything special or different? Oh, yeah, like everyone else, we had to do the big pivot. <laughs> When, when COVID hit, we, like most museums, shut down on March 13th of 2020. Um, we all began working from home. Um, the museum is fortunate enough that um, with its current funding, it was able to keep all of the staff on the payroll. So we, we did not have to lay anybody off. Um, but what we did do is try to put as much as we could online. So I put some um, art activities online that you know parents could do with their kids at home. We did Art and Bloom, which is one of our major events every year where we have um, people from the Laurelwood Garden Club would interpret different works of art around the museum in floral arrangements. And it's always been a very popular event, but of course we couldn't have it in person. So we put it online and changed it a bit. So uh, we challenged people to uh, interpret an artwork using any materials they had at hand. <laughs> so, and then send us a photo and we posted them all online. Um, and what we did was we actually chose a few artworks and put those online and, and gave people the choice of interpreting them. So one of my favorites was somebody did Thurston out of carrot sticks. So people got creative. And it was also nice because we, we had people do it who weren't from Massachusetts even. They were from out of state. So that yeah, that's was one right. of the ways we, we changed. It's one of the one of the silver linings of what we've been through, right? It's just seeing a lot more people from beyond our region. Yes, up at programs, it's yeah. terrific. Yeah, we also have some artist interviews that we uh, that our assistant curator did, and those are online as well. And those were with some of the artists who were in the exhibition that was up at the time we had to close. So. Loretta asks, do you accept donations to your permanent collection? We do. Um, they have to, like 
all art museums, they have to go through what's called a collections committee. Um, they're not they're not accepted by the staff or the you know, not the curator or the directors. Curator can suggest things to the committee, but they don't have a vote in accepting anything. So people can offer something. Uh, the committee will review it and decide whether or not to accept it. We try to accept things that make sense with our collection either as something that complements what we already have or sort of fills in a gap or um, is um, pertinent to like a new area of collecting that we're starting. Okay. And one last question. Uh, Steve wants to know, why does Thurston have that name? Okay, so, um, Thurston was designed by an artist, Doug Kornfeld, who's in Boston. Um, but our director asked him if he would let uh, school children name the sculpture. Uh, and he said yes. And in fact, he actually also partnered with students um, at Monty Tech, or I'm sorry, yeah, Monty Tech, um, to do the fabrication of it. Um, I think they were in the, um, and they also painted it. I think that was the automotive painting class. But we held a contest for um, school children in Fitchburg and in Lemonster, you know, to you know, send us an essay on why they thought it should be named a certain thing and uh, just give us good reasons for that. And the, the one that won um, was by a 13 year old from Fitchburg and she thought it should be named Thurston after a man named Asa Thurston who had lived in Fitchburg in the 1800s and he was a scythe maker. So he worked in metal and she was sort of making this connection between you know, a historical Fitchburg figure working in metal um, and wanting to honor that. And I think also the artist just really loves the name Thurston. <laughs> so um, that's how the name came about. Well, we think it's a great choice. We were talking beforehand about how our staff member Sally Thurston has that name. So uh, we think it's a special name and a nice, nice connection there between Fitchburg and Maynard now. Uh, so thank you very much, Laura. I hope this uh, has whetted people's appetites uh, and made them want to go visit the museum in person uh, as soon as they're able. Uh, there's so much to see there. And that was a, a nice little sneak preview of it. So we appreciate that. I am entering a, a link into the chat. This is for an upcoming program we have, uh, which will be given by Jane O'Neill. She's going to be talking about the Wyeths an American artistic dynasty on December 1st in the evening at seven o'clock. So if you would like to sign up for that, uh, the link there in the chat will take you there or later you can go on our, our website and uh, look under events and you will see it there. So we hope you will join us then. We want to thank Laura again for putting together this beautiful presentation, all the time you put into it. It was just fascinating. And we're also very grateful to you and the Fitchburg Art Museum for allowing us to record it and share it with people that way. Well, thank so. you for asking me. Our pleasure. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Have a good rest of the evening.